was, despite what you were and what you are, he still came and uh, meek and mild and laid in the manger. When I think of meekness, I think immediately of the birth of Jesus Christ and how meek and mild and humble he came. And our Lord and Savior, he didn't come in with uh, a grandeur. He came to a stable, and that's where he was born. Born of a virgin. Oh, in the eyes of the world, Mary would have been much. But in the eyes of the Lord, she was righteous. And what a wonderful thing that is to think that when I'm doing right, when I'm following the Lord, he's noticing. And young people, you remember that. All your lives, the Lord's going to see what you do good. He's going to see what you do bad. He'll reward you and give you blessings that you cannot contain. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Not just what you need, but beyond what you need. What a blessing it is to serve the Lord. I was talking to someone uh, just the other day. We were at that um, uh, restaurant. I think it's Gold Star or something like that on the far side of town. And I was sitting in there, and um, there's a fellow there. And as I was leaving, he started telling about how the Lord um, gave him, uh, opened up doors, and gave him this, and gave him that. And, and it's amazing how the Lord will just reward you. So many times that it's uh, you can't even you can't even name them. Uh, like my thousand dollar jacket that I got for a dollar bill, brand new. Uh, we drove along in Indianapolis, and my dad. I was about a senior in high school, and um, not quite, but he said I'd get you a vehicle. And he told me how much money he had, and that's what I'm willing to spend. And what would you like? Well, I said, I'd like a hot rod. <laughs> and uh, there's a fella down the road here, and I still remember going there, and he had a big Cutlass Classic. And when you would touch the gas, that whole car would do this, like you were on an ocean. That motor was so big. And I went, oh, 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 oh. This is the one I want. It fits the price range, Dad. And Dad said, no. I said, why? He said, I like you alive. And I said, okay, Dad. And he said, so what kind of car, if you could pick one, what would you like? And I know this blows your mind, but when I was a teenager, I had friends. And I know it's strange, but I did. My children don't think that I probably was ever a teenager, but I was at one point. I said, I'd like something that I could take my friends around in, have some extra seats. And we didn't have seat belt laws because we have brains. And uh, we didn't have seat belt laws back then. And so you could just stick, you know, tons of people in. I was driving a Chevy Chevette. <coughs> when I talked to the girls, I called it a vet. True, it was a vet. Not my fault that they thought it was a Corvette. And I'll never forget, it was baby blue. You remember that little Chevette I used to drive? You all remember that? Oh my goodness, it was cute. But as a teenage boy, you don't want cute. Two door Chevy Chevette. I think it was four on the floor. Hatchback, how do you know what a Chevy Chevette looks like? Okay, the rest of you just sit there and act like you're listening. And I got in there now, my neighbor girls, they were older than me, and real pretty girls. Not nearly as pretty as my wife, but they were pretty girls. And I got out there at 16 years old, and Dad said, you can drive the Chevette. I want to drive the Chevette. He took the keys out of my hand and said, okay, and walks off. Guess what I did? Crystal knows what I did. I drove the Chevette what I have. And I get out there and my mom's tried to teach me how to drive a stick shift. Now we call that an anti-theft device. And I get in there and you know <coughs> drove around 
And she said, okay, finally you got the hang of it. I said, well, thank you, Mom. Meek and patient, sweet, sweet lady. So I get out there and I put that Chevette in reverse. and <laughs> Just like that. That's the way it works. And it stalls out. Guess who's behind me? The pretty neighbor girl. Oh, do you have a problem? I knew I stalled it out. I put the emergency brake on, popped the hood, and said, No, I think I can figure this out. I had no idea. I didn't even know where you stuck the oil in the thing. And I'm tinkering and pulling on wires, just trying to make myself look smart. And I didn't know. I just knew I stalled it. She left, and I got back in and complained and griped about that. So my dad said, what would you like? And I said, well, I like mom's car. It's a Mercury Topaz. And, but I'd rather have a Ford. Thank you. And uh, so I said, the Ford is a Tempo. I like it to be two door, limo tent, five on the floor. And the same color. That's pretty picky. So we start praying. He said, we'll pray about it. So I did. And we looked. We looked and we looked and we looked. Ran into that cutlet and I started to change my mind. You know, we're driving through Indianapolis, not really looking for cars, just driving through Indianapolis. I saw a Dodge Daytona. You remember those? The old Dodge Daytona? Mm, good looking car and it moved. And uh, so I saw that up there on the rack. Not that I ever said ever in my life, you can't prove anything. And it sat up there on the front rack and above all the other cars. And I said, Dan, look at that Daytona. Can we go back and look at it? He said, sure. So he did a little whoop de boo and he comes back around and slides in there. I'm looking at the Dodge Daytona. I'm like, yeah, I kind of like it. He said, look back there. I said, where? He said, back there. And there was a two-door Ford Tempo, the same color as my mom, already had limo tint. The tent was so dark that we got stopped before we got home with it. And it had five on the floor. 30,000 miles for $3,000. And so we sell that to you for $3,000. And we bought it, and that became my car. You know, because as a young person, I knew that my God answered prayer. I didn't doubt it. Amen. But how far has our faith slipped sometimes? And so our Heavenly Father, in meekness, came to a faithless people, a shallow people. He took on human flesh, which means his incarnation of Christ, as taking on flesh. Here he is, and he takes on human flesh and becomes likened to the creation. Why? For us. And in my meek spirit, I find that I don't give that much. See, meekness and forgiveness really go in hand in hand. A proud and contrite person isn't a very forgiving person. A bitter person is not a very meek person. They're proud. And I want to be meek, but sometimes it's a little difficult. Especially when I compare myself to the meekness of Christ. Open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 22 and verse number 6, 26, excuse me. I'm sorry, yes, that's right, 26. The bifocals aren't doing their job. I wouldn't blame my eyes, so we'll blame the bifocals. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. What do we see here? The meek are satisfied. <clears throat> oh, what an unsatisfied world. What a, a world, a nation of people who lack meekness. And you say, how do you know that? Because they are never satisfied. Well, we can look at the riots and everything. That's not a meek People satisfied. Young people, unfortunately, in our society, hopefully it's not you, but you're growing up with a group or a generation or generations of un.
satisfied people. No matter what you give them, it's never enough. It's never enough. And I, I look and we, we have school here and we try and find gifts to give the young people. What can you give a child? We usually bail out and just give them food or candy. Because those are children today want for nothing. They're really not for very little. Christmas, they get more presents than they could possibly play with. They get oodles. And they you go into a child's room and there I, I would suppose there are probably toys with dust on them. <clears throat> and it's okay to give children things, but it is not okay, children, to be at a place where you feel like you deserve more than what you get. See, if we really look at it through the eyes of God and with a meek spirit, we would realize that anything greater than hell is a blessing. That's right. Because that's all we really have earned. We've earned hell. And with a meek spirit, we see that we are satisfied and satisfaction not only touches our heart, but it touches us so deeply that then we have a thankful spirit. So we know that a meek spirit goes with forgiveness, but a meek spirit also goes with thankfulness. I wish Thanksgiving was a bigger deal for people. My, my sweet wife loves Thanksgiving, and a thankful spirit is, is often on her heart, probably more so to teach our children how to be thankful than it is on me. So we put up our Christmas tree, and I've told you before, she cut out leaves. And on the leaf you wrote what you're thankful for and hang it on the tree. In her school classroom, she has thankful Thursday. And on the board, on Thursday, you walk into the kindergarten and first grade classroom, and on the board is what they're thankful for. Well, I tell you, you want a blessing? Go in there and see your name. I've never seen any of your names, but I've seen mine. <laughs> thankful for my pastor. He gave me goosebumps. What a meek and sweet spirit. What a meek and sweet spirit. We need that in our lives. We need that in our church. A meek spirit that says, I'll be satisfied doing whatever you want me to do. I want to serve. Oh, a meek person is a serving person, isn't he? Isn't she? A meek person <clears throat> will go and serve. I remember I was on tour. Well, this wasn't tour. They, they had some uh, different schools, uh, Christian schools, that asked me to come and, and preach chapels while I was in Bible college. And this one school called me and said, would you come uh, do chapel? And I did. And um, we would do, I'd usually do some type of a little skit or something in the beginning. And usually it was pick on the teachers is what I like to do. Because kids like that. Get the teachers up there and make them look silly. Lots of fun for me and for the children. One time, this is this is a fun <coughs> one. And we had a little girl, uh, teenagers, teens were all in there. And I said, "Okay, I'm tired of these blonde jokes. You got to cut them out." I said because there is biblical basis on what I'm saying that blondes are not as foolish as you say they are and it is sinful to pick on blondes and tell little jokes the way you've been telling them. Okay, maybe one anyway. And so I said, would you like to know the reference? And they said, yes. I said, Hezekiah 2.5. Look it up. And the one little blonde girl looked for five minutes. It was so funny because there's no book of Hezekiah. And everybody watched her, and she just kept looking. 
And we just stood there, and she said, opened up the front, and said, oh, there isn't a key. No, there isn't. But one way or another, that has nothing to do with the sermon other than it wasn't very meek of me, I guess. And I had these teachers up there, and we were doing some little skit. I can't even remember what it was. And she literally put her hands on her hips and said, I did not go four years to... I don't want to say the name of the college. We'll call it Bob Smith University, but you get the idea. Bob Smith University to be up here doing this. And I said, maybe you can teach your young people how to be submissive and follow directions and be a leader for them today. I never got to go back to that school. <laughs> but meek, that's not a meek spirit. A kind and gentle, caring spirit. And those people are satisfied. You, you see them and you put them in a, in a room. You can lock them in a room full of horse manure. And you would open that door and horse manure would be flying everywhere because they were digging looking for a pony. They are just satisfied people. I know there's a blessing in here somewhere. I want to be that kind of person that looks for not the bright side, but the blessing to God in all circumstances. Because it's there. And again, like we said this morning, there's a cup and it's bitter and we don't want it. But God says you got to have that. Because it's not going to change. I'll give you the grace to see it through. And with a meek spirit, I say, Father, if you'll give me the grace, I'll make it. Father, if you don't give me the grace, I'll go back to with a meek spirit, I bow my knee to him, and he always satisfies. While we're in the book of Psalms, turn to 37 and verse number 11. This meek spirit, 37, 11 says, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Do you know why society doesn't have peace right now? Because they lack meekness. They lack meekness. They are unthankful. They are unsatisfied. They are entitled. All three of those are opposite of a meek spirit. Right. <clears throat> Used to be, we had to teach a man, I believe it was Brother Lee. I can't think of who it was. Um, anyway, he, he wrote the, the track that I lost. Uh, lost preacher saved. I can't think of his name. And, and um, but anyway, he wrote the was telling me one time. He said, "I we get in the bus, and where I grew up, it was all mud roads. And one of us wanted to go to school, so we get in that bus and we start rocking it down these mud roads. And if you rock it enough, the bus would go in the ditch." He said, they didn't have other buses to come get you, so you just got to go home and skip school for the day. He said, it was great. So the bus driver told the principal, and the principal told your dad. And then I got spanked. Nowadays, that changed. <clears throat> because nowadays, parents say, oh, it wasn't Billy's fault. It was everybody else in the bus, but Billy didn't do it. Billy didn't paint that horse. I know it wasn't my Billy. Billy didn't do that. It was somebody else that did that. So it's not everybody's fault but mine. No, we have a meek spirit will take personal responsibility, won't it? I sin. My sin is before me. And meekly we bow before God. Just the way these Wonderful athletes, for their love of country, bow before and kneel before their flag out of honor, respect, and submission. Because that's what kneeling means. We kneel before our God and say, Father, forgive me. I come to you meekly, nothing to offer. And I look to heaven, begging your forgiveness, calling out for your forgiveness. And Lord, I want to be satisfied in what you're giving me. 
I want to have that satisfied spirit. But let's go back to verse number 11. The abundance of peace. Lord, only a meek spirit's going to have peace. Peace with the situation. Peace with themselves. Today, unfortunately, we, we have self-love more than meekness. And these girls do this kissy face to the camera. And that come hither look. Come on. That seductive look. You say, there's no such thing. Bet me. There is a seductive look. And these girls looking at that camera <clears throat> the way a wife looks at her husband. You with me? It's not good. That's not a meek spirit. That meek spirit gives peace. Peace about who you are. Peace about who God made you. Peace about the plan he has for you. But we don't need uh, more uh, young people to have this self-respect as much as we need them to have a meek spirit and a meek spirit says I have peace within my heart about what is the way God made me I have peace about what God's plan is for me and then we turn to Psalm 147 6 just going to tiptoe through the scriptures I'll have you read them all tonight Psalm 147 6 The Lord lifteth up the meek. But just stop right there. The Lord lifteth up the meek. Is it always easy? No. But when the meek man falls, the Lord lifts him. I look at our politicians. Look across Washington, D.C. I look at the Democratic debates. I look at the presidential debates and I say, I find no meekness. Maybe in Mr. Pence. But I look at that and I say, there is not a meek spirit, a spirit of I love the country and I want what's best for you. No. The, it, those debates weren't about loving the country. It was all about attacking the guy on the other podium. Right. On both sides. But we need some meek people. That abrupt and harsh spirit is what led Hamilton to his grave and took everything Burr had. We talked about that this morning. That harsh spirit is a stealer. It is a knocking down. It will knock you down over and over again. It will steal your testimony. It will destroy your relationships. But a meek person. When I was in Bible college, we had these boys who thought they'd get married. Oh, where's the pants in my family when I get married? And she'll tell you how to put them on. Um, that's typically where those guys landed. Well, I'll tell her. Okay. That's real meek. You know, it's a lot easier to submit to somebody who's meek, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Come on. Someone who asks instead of demands. Someone who talks with you instead of talking at you. You know what I mean. You've had bosses that are that way. They talk at you instead of talking with you. That's not a meek spirit. Oh, can you win? Yes, you can win in the game of life if you call that winning. There's a book that's entitled um, How to Win but through intimidation. It's a book, How to Win Through Intimidation. Do you really want to be that person? It's not the person God wants you to be. So we look at the scripture and God 
will lift you in 147, verse number 6, great, sorry, the Lord lifteth up the meek and casteth the wicked down to the ground. Cast them down to the ground. I remember the many times that we would play uh, football at camp. We played two-hand shove. It was supposed to be touch, but it was shove. I mean, it's just the way it was. And we would play, and we would do a five-yard bump. I don't know a whole lot about football other than get the ball, run, knock somebody over. That's about all I needed to know. And I was pretty good at knocking people down. And um, so I would be there on the line, and they're trying to get to the quarterback. Or if I was running, if we could call it a route, but if I was running as a receiver, I would knock the guy on his back if I could because I had that five yards to bump him. And so these guys would get mad. It was a rule, and we did it. And the more angry they would get, I found that I didn't have to touch you. All I had to do was make you angry and then step out of your way. You were going to tackle yourself. So you'd get these guys pumped up and then they would hike the ball and I'd drop my shoulder and just do this and watch them fall on their face and I'd take off running. It was real simple. But that's where a, a angry spirit will get you. It'll get you a mouthful of dirt. You will end up being on the ground and you will hate where you are. And again, we have the turtle. I'm bruised and I'm battered, but it's okay. Because I'm not destroyed. Well, sooner or later, that angry spirit's going to destroy about every relationship you have. The Bible even tells people not to be your friend. Did you know that? That the Bible says not to be a friend of an angry person. In other words, shun that person. Because they bite. <laughs> Stay away from them. My dad, well, it's my mom's bird. My dad uh, would never have claimed it. My mom's bird, one of my nephews used to take and poke at it, like with a stick, poke at it. My mom and dad would get after him. They're a little bitty at the time, poke at it. And finally, it'd get hold of you, and it'd make you believe. The bird learned new words. It could say things, we'd say be an eagle, and it'd stick its, arm, its arms, its wings up, and do the little thing. It was a cute little bird, my mom loved it. It'd do this and this. But finally I walked in, and I said, the bird learned new words, Mom. She said, oh yeah, that's because of your nephew. And I'd listen, I said, what's it saying? And it'd squawk out, I bite, I bite, I bite. Well, it's a saying, get away from me or I'm going to bite you. You know, you don't have to say you bite. You just look around and nobody wants to be around you because you have that harsh spirit that is opposite of meekness. The Lord's not working that person. Had a uh, friend who he, he never talked with you. He always talked at you. And this is something I see a lot of young people today. Have you noticed that they think they're asking you for something? Like my teachers, I want you to look at me real good now and, and nod your head. This is yes and this is no. And, but have you noticed children will say, give me that book, please, and consider that asking? How many of you have ever seen that? Give me that book, please. And they think you're asking you for something. That's not asking. That's demanding with a please on the end. And I say, when you ask me, maybe I will. Sound pretty good? Sounds pretty good to me. When you ask, I will. I had a friend like that. Go do this, please. I said, when you ask, I did ask. No, you didn't. But that's the society we see. An unmeet, a self-centered, and entitled society that says it's all about me. A meek spirit doesn't do that. The meek will be lifted up by the Lord and they're going to have joy. Oh, the joy of a meek spirit. Not only will they have joy, but they will also um, be an ornament 
of great price in the eyes of the Lord. Turn in your Bibles then to 1 Peter. I'm going to jump all the way to the back. 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 4. 1 Peter 3, 4. But let it be hidden, be the hidden man of the heart, in which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of the Lord, or sight of God, a great price. Oh, you sweet girls, listen a little bit. Mm -hmm. That sweet, meek, and quiet spirit. You young boys, you listen to me really good. That sweet, quiet, and meek spirit. It doesn't make you less of a man. You can be meek without being weak. There are some fellas who have to prove their strength. Look how tough I am, and look at this, and look at that. Those are always the boys, you remember this, those are always the boys that are hiding something. You don't have to tell people you're a man, just be a man. Sure. Just be a man. I have to prove it. I am a man. I don't have to tell you how strong or be abrupt to be a man. A meek man. We can take it on the chin sometimes. See, boys, someday you're going to have to take it on the chin. You're going to have to know how to do that. How to do it with a meek spirit. And say, I don't always have to be right. I don't have to always win. That meek spirit is a great, is a great reward to the Lord. Don't you want to please Him with that meek spirit? And then not only do we see many blessings about meekness, but then we see some warnings and some dangers about it. Let's turn back to Psalm chapter 12. We'll flip all the way back. Psalm chapter 12. Psalm 12 and verse number 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Those who are con uh, consumed with pride and, and arrogance, oh, don't you love to see them fall? I know it's carnal. I know it's pride on our side. But the braggadocious person. You ever meet any nurses like that, sister? Yeah. Well, I do this. I met a nurse like that. Hyper braggadocious nurse. He comes into my house to do some life insurance thing or something like that. And he had to check my weight and my temperature and my blood and all that. And he's bragging, oh, I worked here and I worked there and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And he just kept going and going. And I said, wow, you're amazing. And you know, well, oh, yeah, no, I didn't. And I, he, that's about all he talked about was himself. And I was like, okay. I don't even bruise anybody. I've never bruised anybody taking blood in my life. I said, glad you're on my team. And he's, you know, that's not really the noise that it made, but it's what it makes in my, I have to do this when I take blood. I, I can't look, I'll pass out. He takes blood. And he da 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 he takes the vial off or whatever he does, and he's taking more blood, and I don't know why. And all of a sudden, he takes that needle and goes to put it up, and it goes <laughs> right into his hand. It goes Doing. And Mr. Perfect Nurse is going. Because my blood is now in his body. That's not where you want somebody else's blood, right? Especially untested and all that. And it's it's hilarious. It, I mean, it's just sticking in there like it was a spear. And in my soul, it was not me, but I am dying laughing. 
Mr. Perfect just took <laughs> my blood and his body, my dirty ego, which he used. Anyway, I won't tell you all the things I thought I had to repent later. And uh, so there's this needle sticking out of his hand, and I go, <laughs> about now you're glad I'm a preacher, huh? <laughs> he says, wait, wait, oh, you don't have anything, do you? I said, not the last time I checked. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to tell you, inside of us, when you get around braggadocious people, even though it's carnal, we like to say, ha ha, he got it. You just like to see him lose. Anybody carnal like that? Anybody? It, we shouldn't. But yet it's our flesh. The team that brags we're going to win. And then they lose. Well, it's not a meek spirit to be happy at someone else's failure. But I want you to know that braggadocious spirit God doesn't bless. Right. He just doesn't. So we see that not only does he not bless it, so the blessing is taken away, but he stops your tongue. He'll take things, and you won't be able to brag anymore. Not only that, but he's not going to draw close to you. Psalm 138. Psalm 138 and verse number 6. Verse number 6 says this, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You can't be a proud person and walk in with God close. Sure. You can't be walking in the sin of pride and say, Oh, I walk with the Lord. These people say, oh, I know this, and they'll brag about their spiritual life. And if that's you and your self-righteousness, God's not going to bless that. I walk close with God, and da 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 Oh, wait a second. God's not in your pride. It's, he must increase, and I must decrease. That's the meek heart God's looking for. Is that your heart? Are you at that place in your life where you say, God is everything, and I am just this servant. If it's decorating for a drive through Christmas play, doing the work of the pastor, it wasn't my idea. If it's putting out lighting for a drive through Christmas play, this is the pastor's idea, but I'm willing. If it's steering people through it, and all the different things, and picking up sheep. <laughs> we can blame that on his wife. And we look out here, and all these things I couldn't do, others doing for the glory of God and the vision of their pastor. It's humbling to me. What sweet, meek spirit. Embrace that. That meek spirit. Father, if I could just serve you, if you give me the chance to clean toilets for you, oh, what a pleasure. Oh, you say, oh, those are disgusting. That, no, 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 no. You see, you, you see the, the grind and the job. I see who I serve. In meekness, we don't look at the demeaning job. We look at the glorious opportunity to serve him and to be blessed with heads bowed and eyes closed.